In this week's reading of Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah, this presentation, we will concern ourselves with the book of Habakkuk. Again, read the book and the chapters before watching or listening to the presentation. I think you'll get more out of it. Let's start with a little introduction. A prophet of Judah is Habakkuk, the date of which he prophesied is uncertain, possibly in the reign of Josiah or Jehoiakim, about 600 B.C. Nothing beyond this is known about him. Sidney B. Sperry writes about Habakkuk, differs markedly from the other prophetic books, whereas most of the others contain the words of the Lord addressed to the people, and the book of Habakkuk, the prophet, as the representative of the people, addresses and challenges the Lord. He begins by complaining about the apparent indifference of the Lord to violent strife and widespread corruption in Judah. The prophet is puzzled over this indifference, knowing as he does the righteous and holy character of God. The Lord, in answer to his complaining, states that he is about to raise up the Chaldeans to execute judgment. The prophet is only the more perplexed at this answer, for he fails to understand why the Lord should use the cruel and fierce Chaldeans to execute judgment upon people who are more righteous than they are. The Lord, however, points out that the Chaldeans are to be but temporary triumphs temporarily triumphant. They shall eventually meet with destruction, whereas the righteous shall live by faith. The oppressed nations may begin at once to rejoice over the fall of the Chaldeans, hence the prophet's taunt song against them, which takes the form of five woes upon the corrupt traits in the enemy's character and his many cruelties. The book ends in a beautiful anthem of praise called the title of chapter 3, A Prayer of Habakkuk the Prophet. Thus we see, but behold, the judgment of God will overtake the wicked, and it is by the wicked that the wicked are punished, for it is the wicked that stirth up the hearts of the children of men unto bloodshed. Mormon 4, five. I put that in because as Habakkuk learns from the Lord that the wickedness of Judea will be destroyed by the wickedness of the Chaldeans. And then later on, the wickedness of the Chaldeans will be destroyed by the wickedness of other kingdoms. And so the Lord does use the wicked to kill and punish the wicked. Let's begin Habakkuk chapter 1 through chapters 2, verse 4. The prophet's burden and then the answer of Jehovah. Habakkuk concern and Jehovah's response. Habakkuk, like other prophets through the ages, wondered why the Lord would not answer his prayers. Doubtless everyone who believes in God has felt forsaken at times. Joseph Smith and even Jesus experienced this loneliness at least once in their lives. So another reason for at least one reason why this book is profitable to us in the latter days and why Jehovah probably had it included in the Old Testament is we can all relate to not feeling like God has answered our prayers and wondering why. And so Habakkuk is facing that. Ellis T. Rasmussen, a great Hebrew biblical scholar, describes Habakkuk's dilemma in this way. Habakkuk's miseries likely arose in the day of Judea's degeneration, after the time of Assyrian's conquest of northern Israel, and before the time when Babylonia came to carry the remaining tribe Judah away into captivity. The religious reforms of Hezekiah in his century and those of Josiah a hundred years later, about 620 B.C., had put the just and the right at the helm in Judah for a time. But as always, resurgent corruption in politics, in morals, and in religion swiftly reappeared when the champions of right were gone. Religious compromise induced by the desires of the liberal and the libertine ever seeking to soften the restrictions and responsibilities of Israel's covenant faith, brought derision and persecution upon the pious and the faithful. Under these conditions, Jeremiah suffered, and it is likely that this was awful the setting of Habakkuk's ministry. And interrupting his quote here, this is also what Lehi was suffering during the time of Jeremiah, and they were about to kill him and why Lehi is told to leave. Back to 
Brother Rasmussen. Thus, it is that he cries out against the injuries, grievance, spoiling, violence, strife, and contention on every side. For the process of justice and the execution of the law seem endlessly delayed when the righteous are encompassed about by the wicked. And so Habakkuk is concerned. Why are the righteous being treated so cruelly? Why is justice being delayed? Why is there such corruption, not only within the government, but also within the religion itself amongst the church members? Remember, the, the government and religion were intertwined at this time during the history of Israel. And so there's great corruption and strife and contention everywhere as the kingdom of Judah is falling in corruption. So, number one, verse chapter one, verses two through four, here is the first query that Habakkuk has towards Jehovah. Why does the Lord remain apparently indifferent in the presence of iniquity and violence? So that's verses two through four. That is what he's asking there. Number two, the Lord's answer is, he is not indifferent. The Chaldeans are to execute his judgment. For the Lord, in answer to the prophet's query as to his indifference, gives him to understand that he is not indifferent. Judgment is to be executed upon the wicked, for the fierce and terrible Chaldeans are to be his agents. So he says, Habakkuk, the Chaldeans, the Assyrians, will come and destroy the wicked of Judah and the injustices that are heaped upon them. I will use the nation of the Chaldeans or as we know as the Assyrians, to accomplish this. Well, that raises some other concerns that Habakkuk has. His second query, number, number three on our list, why does the Lord, who is pure, holy, and everlasting, choose a wicked nation to punish people more righteous than itself? So Habakkuk at least has seen some of the righteous in Judah and sees the total depravity of the Assyrians, and so I was wondering, why would you use a wicked nation to destroy at least some that are righteous here? He knows that Judah is in wickedness, but evidently doesn't feel that they're as wicked as the Assyrians. How is it possible for the Lord to employ the Chaldeans and contone their cruelties? Is a wicked nation to be allowed to swallow up another nation that is more righteous than itself? Are the righteous Jews to be exterminated by the treacherous foreigners? That's chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. Is that is what he's this so that's what those verses are about. I need to correct myself. The Chaldeans would be the Babylonians, not the Assyrians. The Babylonians are the ones who will come and destroy Judah, the kingdom of Judah, the, the southern kingdom of Israel. Well, Habakkuk's lament is one that has been raised by many. Why does the Lord allow wicked people and nations to operate? And why are they allowed in some cases to punish God's people? Habakkuk did not mention the Babylonians, Chaldeans, in his question, verses 1 through 4, but it is obvious from the Lord's answer that they were the ones whom Habakkuk was thinking. So he's concerned about this. He's wondering. He sees the injustice. He sees the wickedness within the tribe, not the tribe, the kingdom of Judah, amongst the church members of the church, and that there is problems. But then he's wondering why he's using the Babylonians to come and cause the punishment and to destroy the wicked. The Lord replied, he intended to use the Chaldeans for his righteous purposes in such a way that it would be difficult for Habakkuk to believe it. That's verses 5 through 6. The Lord's response merely increases Habakkuk's confusion. How could God condone the cruelties of a nation more wicked than Judah? Were the Chaldeans never to get what was due to them for their evil ways? Habakkuk's faith was being tested. What about their punishment? Who, who's going to take care of them? So all of this is wrapped up in Habakkuk and justice and fairness and all of that. We all have questions about this immortality. Through the faith of the, though the faith of the prophet is tested severely, he does not allow it to be wrecked. See, it's okay to question, ask questions of God. Just don't let your doubts or that to destroy your faith. He watches and waits to see what the Lord will tell him. Chapter 2, verse 1. And therein lies a profound lesson for us all. 
the Lord grants him a vision which is to be written down. For while its fulfillment may be delayed, it will certainly come to pass. The gr one of the another great lessons we can learn from Habakkuk is though I may not have answers to everything I have right now, continue in my faith, continue to wait upon the Lord, and watch and wait and see what he does. And continue in what I know to be true until Christ and Heavenly Father deem it proper to answer me in the specific things that I have. That is a profound lesson. There are too many that if they don't get an immediate answer, then they become offended at God and leave and leave the church and whatever. And Well, that really turned out well then, didn't it? Yeah, go to hell. That'll show Jehovah. Get mad at Jehovah. Go to hell and that'll show him. Uh, that seems to be the reasoning of some, and it's awfully stupid. So, number four, the Lord's answer to these, this perplexing inquiry that he has. The Chaldeans may be temporarily puffed up, but their end is certain. The righteous may be afflicted temporarily, but they shall live by faith forever. Don't worry, the Chaldeans will get theirs, Habakkuk. If maybe one thing Habakkuk's learning that we all need to learn is Habakkuk, it's not your problem. I am the Lord. Vengeance is mine. I will take care of it. The same is true of people that offend us and commit atrocities against us. It is not our job to make sure that justice is done quickly and immediately, or when it is done, that is left up to Jehovah. And Habakkuk is learning this. Jehovah tells him, don't worry. I used the Chaldeans for a time. Their punishment will be coming. Just like I, the last presentation, Nahum said the punishment of the Syrians would come, and it did. And the punishment will come to the Chaldeans. They will be overtaken by the Medes and the Persians, and their nation will be destroyed. The more important thing, Habakkuk, is that the righteous will live by faith. That's the key. Not to get caught up in demanding immediate justice of everything right now. That will only lead to sorrow and unfulfilled expectations and just leave you bitter. You must leave it in the hands of God. Sidney B. Sperry, a great Old Testament scholar explained what it means, but they shall live by faith. This verse is one of the great passages of the Old Testament. It means essentially this. There is a moral and spiritual distinction between the Chaldeans and the people of Judah. The Chaldeans puffed up and arrogant, priding themselves in their wealth and power, and deceptive in their dealings with other nations, do not possess the moral and spiritual elements which alone can ensure permanence and stability. The people of the Lord, on the other hand, should possess moral integrity, fidelity, and spiritual insight, which ensure for them a future. The future belongs to the righteous. When the prophet says that the righteous shall live by faith, more accurately, faithfulness, he implies permanency. Faithfulness is what the prophet is with the prophet an external thing. It signifies integrity, fidelity, steadfastness under all provocations. But this implies, in a real sense, the New Testament concept of faith as an active principle of right conduct. A living faith determines conduct. Religion and ethics go hand in hand. And especially in the hour of adversity, a belief in Jehovah, an unflinching reliance upon him, are the strongest preservers of fidelity and integrity. Faith without works is dead. Faith expresses itself in life. Habakkuk places chief emphasis upon the expressions of faith, and he does so rightly. But in doing this, he also causes attention calls attention, by implication at least, to the, more motive, the, to the motive power behind the external manifestations. The motive, why do I do what I do? What is my motive behind it? That is, if not as important, more important than what I do. You can do the right thing for the wrong reason, and then it's as if you'd never done it, in God's eyes. And so Habakkuk learns 
that the righteous, those who have integrity, fidelity, steadfastness, and have right conduct in Jehovah, they will be preserved. You will have permanency. You'll have that contentment in your life. The prophet is thus assured by the Lord that the righteous among his people will in the end triumph, whereas the cruel and unrighteous Chaldeans must inevitably perish. There is where steadfastness and permanency comes from in having a witness from the Holy Ghost that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is true and that as you stay true to Christ through it, through your covenants and ordinances, then you will receive a sure witness that his gospel, his church, his kingdom will triumph, regardless of all the odds against it. And that we have to wait upon the Lord to see and to put our trust in him and to follow faithfully. This book of Habakkuk is so critical for us today. That same message he's telling Habakkuk is what we need today. Because we see all kinds of injustices around us that not just see it, but we probably experience them. And if I'm not going to get caught up in becoming offended at God and leaving and, and destroying all my faith and giving up my exaltation, that I must trust that God has all things in hand in his time, in his way, not mine. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 5 through 20. Habakkuk now has a taunt song over the destruction of the Chaldeans. Once the prophet sees that God has determined the destruction of the cruel Chaldeans, he has the vanquished and enslaved nations lift up their voices in a series of five woes or curses in combination of the foe. In our age of power politics, all nations seeking unrighteous dominion over others ought to consider carefully the whole taunt song of Habakkuk. It has particular value in our times. So in other words... This is also a type of the last days. Just as there is un injustice today and wrongs in government and in society, and that one day those wrongs will be righted and that they will be punished and that judgment will come upon the wicked nations, people, societies, individuals, whatever, then these five woes we ought to pay attention to because they will happen again in the latter days to the same people who commit the same sins. So, verses, chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, the first woe, woe unto him that increases that which is not his. So he who gains increase through deceit, through bribery, through uh, unrighteousness, through deceptive means. Chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Woe to him that gaineth evil gains for his house, that he may set up his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. So those who put their trust in things and money and gains, that their whole existence is for power and for gain. Remember, that's what Ether says that the secret combinations were for, for power and gain, that set themselves up and destroy others for power and gain. Woe unto them, they will be destroyed. Chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, woe, and I forgot to mention, woe means deep sorrow and suffering. So deep sorrow and suffering will come to him that buildeth a town with blood and establish a city by iniquity. Woe unto those who use the lives of others physical bloodshed or even spiritual bloodshed or figuratively and through iniquity and bribery and corruption, all of that, to build up themselves, to build up their own town, to build up their family, their life. Woe to them. Chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Woe, or deep suffering sorrow, unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest the venom thereunto, and maketh him drunk also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Woe unto those who use others, who will use vices in the last days to take advantage of one another. As then, today, many will use alcohol, drugs, and other things, 
and their lusts of sexuality and sex and all of that to take advantage of others. Chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. I'm sorry, not 81, 18. Woe or deep sorrow suffering unto him that saith to the wood, Awake, to the dumb stone, Arise. Now that one makes no sense unless you understand. They're talking about the wood and the stone that they used to make their idols. One to those who believed in false god and worshipped idols. And it wasn't just wood and stone, but the works of their own hands. Do we worship the works of our own hands today? Oh my gosh, do we in society. Thinking that material things is success. And that's what it's all about. Woe unto them who put their trust in their riches, their wealth, their character, their things, their substance, and they worship them. Well, Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. What are Signonot and Selah in these, these verses? Uh, Signonot may have been a string instrument or perhaps a musical expression used to accompany singers. Possibly this prayer of Habakkuk was set to music intended for use in the temple. A selah was a cue for the person singing or chanting the words. The use of this word in Psalms is further evidence that Habakkuk's prayer may have been set to music. The prophet, first of all, petitions the Lord to renew his loving kindness, power, and goodness in delivering his people as he did in the days of old. In other words, he wants a revival of God's work for the benefit of his people now living in the midst of the years. Habakkuk 3, verses 3 through 19, trust in God. In verses 3 through 15, we have a magnificent theophany in which the prophet describes the coming of the Lord in the glory of his omnipotence to deliver his people and his anointed from the bondage of the power of the world. Pestilence and great earthly manifestations precede his indignant march to thresh the nations in anger. Again, in anger just means in judgment, in justice. God isn't fuming and having smoke coming out of his nose and ears and just mad and yelling. No, he will thresh or destroy the nations in judgment, in righteous judgment, in righteousness, because that's what they've chosen. You don't want justice, then repent, and that's the only way you can get mercy. The entire chapter is excellent Hebrew poetry. Habakkuk makes a number of references to events of Moses and Joshua's time. Anyone familiar with those biblical events will recognize the ones alluded to. The burden of Habakkuk's prayer is for Jehovah to return and sustain Israel as in days of old. This he will surely do in the latter days. Habakkuk's trust was fully in God. So Habakkuk learns, even though it will come many thousands of years later, God will restore Israel to its former beauty and power. But it will be through the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, and the gathering of Israel and the return of the lost ten tribes to said church. Ellis T. Rasmussen, another biblical scholar, said of Habakkuk's song of praise, After his experience, Habakkuk felt inspired to utter a psalm of praise to God and trust in him. In awe at the powers and glory of God, he poetically describes the power of deity over all facets and functions of nature, and speaks of his might to overcome all of his enemies. Then in the spirit expressed also by Job, who said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, Habakkuk lists in six poetic lines the disasters that could come to him, but strongly he avers, avers in his last five lines... Yet I will rejoice in thee, in the Lord. I will joy in the Lord of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like his hind feet, and he will make me to walk upon high places. That is faithfulness. That is what we need in the midst of all the injustice that we see, all the wrongs that we see, all the unfairness. Yes, life is unfair. Until in the next life, God corrects it all. 
Therefore, down here, we must learn how to rejoice in the Lord, in God's salvation, to make God our strength in the midst of all the injustices that will be heaped upon society and upon us personally. We will only get through it if we will make, he will make our feet to fight his and to follow him. That Habakkuk learns. That we must be faithful. That I must endure to the end. Be steadfast in Christ. For that is the only one I can trust in and realize one day, one day he will make all wrongs right. Somehow, some way, in his own way and his own time. And we must trust in that. Or we will be overcome with envy, with pride. And then we'll lose everything. It is for this trust in God, in spite of the vicissitudes of life, that Habakkuk's message is for us also today a wholesome stimulant. We also need that kind of trust in God if we are going to make it through the last days. And that, brothers and sisters, will require constant revelation from the Holy Ghost. To the other great lesson we have already learned in Habakkuk, that the righteous shall live by faith, we must add another. It is that the Lord is supreme over all the earth. The destinies of all the nations lie in his hands. In other words, everything is going according to plan down here. We must learn how to trust Jehovah that he knows what he's doing and he has it all under control. If you don't have that kind of trust in him, then you can't put your total faith in him. The wicked may temporarily triumph, but their rule is eventually cut short, for righteousness must achieve supremacy in a world over which the Lord is head, and it will, that I know to be sure and true. Well, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and please subscribe to the channel.